What we need is not more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé, coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. I'm your regular host, Tony Akiyam. Don't, don't forget, what we need what is we not need more medication, more medication but, more but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. Welcome to Expose with Tony Akiyami. In the last episode, we concluded, as it were, our discourse on hydrogen therapy. Uh, I actually promised that we'll be looking at three of the gases, three of the medical gases or therapeutic gases extensively. Hydrogen being one of them. The other two are oxygen and ozone. So in the last episode, we concluded our discussion, at least so far, on hydrogen therapy. We looked at different ways by which hydrogen can be administered. You can inhale it by going to a clinic or obtaining the equipment at home for home use. You just mount the inhaler and then you inhale it as the gas is being generated. You can also actually also drink hydrogenated water. And I showed you my own water bottle at the time. See, I, as it is now, it's generating the hydrogen gas in the water. You can see the bubble, I hope. You can see that on the screen. It's bubbling through. I pressed it once, it will bubble for about three minutes. If I press the button twice, it will bubble for about 10 minutes. And the water becomes hydrogenated water. And you can drink it. That's the second way you can administer hydrogen. The third way is to generate the hydrogen water and then put it in a nebulizer. I'll be showing you a nebulizer subsequently in another episode. You just put the hydrogenated water in the nebulizer and then you can nebulize. I'll show you how to do that as time goes on. So that effectively brings us to uh, the end of our conversation on hydrogen gas therapy. Now we'll be moving on to the second gas today, which is oxygen therapy. But then before we do oxygen therapy, I want to highlight something. That's the fact that you can actually do a combination of hydrogen therapy with supplemental oxygen therapy for certain conditions, particularly COPDs. COPDs are chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, things like emphysema and so on and so forth. Uh, people with such conditions can benefit immensely when you combine molecular hydrogen therapy with supplemental oxygen therapy. Now, many COPD patients suffer from shortness of breath. There's a temptation to use only supplemental oxygen therapy in such people, you know, in, by conventional medical practitioners, because it's important to make sure that the organs in a COPD patient receive plenty of oxygen. So the temptation is to administer only oxygen. So when oxygen alone, supplemental oxygen alone, is used by itself for COPD patients, just because we want to ensure that they get sufficient oxygen, it definitely will reduce uh, hypoxia. Hypoxia means low oxygen level, okay? As well as the attendant downward spiraling effect of hypoxia on the heart, on the liver, on blood supply and what have you. But too much oxygen through supplemental oxygen can begin to function as an oxidant, okay, in the lungs. And this happens particularly in, in individuals that have obstructive lung disease, where the oxygen begins to irritate the airways. It gets trapped there and then it cannot escape, and that becomes a problem when oxygen alone is used. But when you use supplemental oxygen uh, therapy along with nebulized molecular hydrogen, you know, I, I told you I'll be showing you a nebulizer 
and how to nebulize with oxygen or any other material, hydrogen peroxide, uh, sodium chloride, all kinds of different things can be nebulized. So when you use supplemental oxygen therapy with nebulized molecular hydrogen, on the other hand, not only does it reduce inflammation in the airways, it also allows better oxygenation of the organs just by breathing regular air, the molecular hydrogen can also reduce oxidant-related cell death or damage that is caused by oxygen that gets trapped in the lungs as a result of obstructions. So a combination of hydrogen therapy with oxygen therapy is a very good combo. Now, studies have shown that patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, uh, hydrogen and oxygen therapy administered together to such patients is superior to oxygen therapy alone administered by itself. So in patients with COPD, this combo therapy of hydrogen on the one hand and oxygen on the other hand has a very, very good safety profile at the end of the day. That's the dimension I wanted to bring. We have discussed hydrogen therapy. Now we want to start discussing oxygen therapy. Now, so what are the indications for oxygen therapy? In other words, who needs oxygen therapy? That is supplemental oxygen therapy. Of course, all of us need oxygen. That's why we breathe. As we breathe in fresh air, the oxygen component in the air we breathe in is extracted in our lungs, and then it goes into the blood and is circulated around the body to oxygenate the body. But some individuals need to be given additional oxygen. That's what we call supplemental oxygen. Now, so who and who and who actually needs supplemental oxygen. We call that the indications for who is oxygen indicated. All right, so the indications for oxygen therapy include a number of you know, conditions. The most readily accepted indication for supplemental oxygen is hypoxemia or decreased levels of oxygen in the blood. The moment a person has decreased level of oxygen in the blood, that person needs uh, supplemental oxygen. Now, for the otherwise healthy person, oxygen saturation targets are generally somewhere between 92% uh, and 98%. Uh, maybe in the next episode, I will bring you uh, uh, a device and show you the pulse oximeter that you just clip to your finger to measure the percentage oxygen saturation in your blood. Okay, so when you use that pulse oximeter, the saturation for a healthy person should be somewhere between 92%, 98%, maybe 99%. Now, for people that have chronic hypercapnic conditions, yeah, that is abnormal carbon dioxide retention in the body because some people, you know, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Some people are not able to exhale the carbon dioxide properly. So much of the carbon dioxide is trapped inside their body and that is what we call chronic hypercapnic condition all right so people with such a condition okay the target oxygen saturation are generally between 88 percent and 92 percent with oxygen administration indicated as saturations that are below those levels now oxygen level is commonly measured like i said with a pulse oximeter but a pulse oximeter can give you know, falsely elevated readings in people with anemia. That's low PCVs, low packed cell volume. Okay, when somebody's blood level is low, the person is anemic. When the person is anemic, then the pulse oximeter can give falsely elevated readings. Okay, people that have cyanide poisoning or carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, these are people that can also have false, you know, readings when you use pulse oximeter. You know, because uh, the machine, actually, the, the equipment actually works better when your blood is normal, within the normal PCV range. Okay? So, uh, usually, the oximeter is not an adequate indicator of perfusion, uh, particularly when somebody, for example, is in a state of shock. Okay? So, now, for chronic conditions and acute conditions, they may require... Uh, oxygen therapy, those that oxygen therapy may be indicated for. So we're going to be dividing the people that will be 
that may need oxygen therapy into two categories or we will look at medical conditions that may require oxygen therapy and we divide them into two conditions okay some of them are chronic conditions some of them are acute conditions so uh, examples of chronic conditions that can benefit immensely from oxygen therapy includes those suffering from COPD like I've said chronic obstructive pul pulmonary disease uh, people that are suffering from cystic fibrosis uh, people suffering from pulmonary fibrosis okay people that are experiencing or suffering from sarcoidosis uh, sarcoidosis is a kind of autoimmune problem okay that can attack different parts of the body now people who are experiencing that can definitely benefit from oxygen therapy those are conditions that exist long term in the body that's why we call them chronic conditions they can begin to improve gradually over time as their bodies begin to rebuild again then there are also acute medical conditions that people can uh, that people can experience and they can benefit from oxygen therapy so medical emergencies that require concentrations of oxygen in all cases include things like shock like sepsis like major trauma okay cardiac arrest uh, and during resuscitation of somebody who has just suffered a cardiac arrest and people who have experienced anaphylaxis you know a kind of uh, allergic reaction that makes them to pass out completely and then people who have carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide poisoning or transfusion related acute lung injury all of these will benefit from you know supplemental oxygen definitely and then there are medical emergencies that may or may not require oxygen administration people with asthma people with bronchitis people with acute heart failure or heart failure exacerbations or pulmonary embolism that is when there's a blood clot that migrates into the lungs and is causing you know difficulty in breathing in the lungs okay such people may require oxygen therapy or they may not now when a person has been found to require oxygen therapy or supplemental oxygen there are different ways of administering the oxygen to them i'm going to be talking about four categories uh, four different ways of administering oxygen to people there is the one that is called low flow administration low flow then there is the high flow administration as the names indicate it means that the oxygen is flowing uh, slowly that's low flow and then there's one that is the oxygen is flowing highly <laughs> that's called high flow administration the third one is called positive pressure administration and the fourth one we'll be looking at all other methods of administration combined now let's take them one by one let's take the low flow administration now there are essentially four different ways of administering low flow oxygen administration one it can be by nasal cannula where they pass you know the cannula is is like a tube and then it has these two things that will go into the two nostrils and then it is wound around the back of the ear and then connected to the source of oxygen so the oxygen is coming and it's being breathed in or inhaled directly by the nasal cannula that's one way of a low flow oxygen administration the other one is what we call transtracheal catheter i'll be showing you uh, images as we go on you know and then the third one is by using face masks okay and the fourth one is the non-breather mask let's take them in turn one by one let's start with the nasal cannula now the nasal cannula is a thin tube often uh, affixed behind the ears and used to deliver oxygen directly into the nostrils from a source that is connected with tubing to the oxygen source okay now this is the most common method of delivery for home use for those who need oxygen at home they have the oxygen tank and then they use that nasal cannula they connect it to the nostrils and they are breathing in oxygen okay uh, it provides flow rates of approximately two to six liters of oxygen per minute all right uh, and you can do that very comfortably it allows the individual you know to have oxygen delivered to them as they are breathing it in while they are still maintaining the ability to utilize their their hands and their mouth actually when the person is using the nasal cannula they can talk they can eat they can perform other tasks you know that is the benefit of using the nasal cannula to deliver oxygen now 
you can see, uh, I believe they'll show you images of people that are wearing the NASA cannula and they are using it to kind of deliver oxygen into their nostrils. Uh, that is one. Then the second method of low flow administration is the transtracheal catheter. Now, the, these catheters are used in chronic maintenance therapy. Uh, they present a method of oxygenation in which a catheter is uh, surgically inserted, you know, through the anterior neck to deliver oxygen directly to the trachea. And that kind of bypasses the upper airway. So that requires a surgical insertion of the catheter. Okay, by bypassing the upper airway, oxygen delivery is now closer to the alveoli. All right, it bypasses the dead space in the upper airway, uh, and thus this allows for extended use of lower amounts of oxygen without reducing the amount of supplemental oxygen delivered to the lungs. Now, this arrangement allows for more extended use of supplemental oxygen, and it allows the person to be away from home for longer periods, but it does require surgical intervention, like I said earlier, they have to kind of puncture the base of the neck and insert the catheter there, and the oxygen is delivered almost directly into the lungs by passing the airways, okay? Now, that surgical placement has potential for, you know, infection of the surgical site, uh, irritation of the surgical site, and a few complications, you know, uh, that usually are common to such procedures. Now, again, you will see the image on the screen of the transtracheal uh, catheter. Now, the third one is face masks. Now, face masks can be generally divided into three categories. We have the simple face mask, which is a mask with no bag attached. And this delivers oxygen to uh, the individual at a rate of about five to eight liters per minute. The second type of face mask for delivering oxygen is called air entrainment masks. It's also known as Venturi. Okay, it can provide a preset oxygen to the person. It uses a jet that mixes, you know, the air that is going into the person. As the percentage of inspired oxygen increases using such a mask, you know, the air to oxygen ratio begins to decrease. And it causes the maximum concentration of oxygen provided by an air entrainment mask to be around 40%. Now, the disadvantage of this uh, is that, the, uh, that, that is the air entrainment mask is that you know the, the individual is unable to eat or drink or easily communicate <laughs> while using such a device. And the third type of face mask is called the non-breather face mask, non-breather face mask. Now, when oxygen is administered via face masks, typically that is usually what uh, most people, most practitioners use, uh, either the face mask or the nasal cannula. Now, usually it is the attending physician that will prescribe the oxygen administering method, whichever one he considers the best approach for that particular individual. Uh, this avoids administration of too much or too little oxygen. Now, oxygen saturation of blood is then monitored. There's a screen to monitor how the oxygen is flowing and to know the level of blood saturation of oxygen. The aim is to keep the oxygen saturation more than 94%. And in case of COPD uh, patients or a patient who is at risk of developing hypercapnia, you know, that's, you know, the, the backup of carbon dioxide inside the body. You want to keep the oxygen saturation uh, at between 88% and 92%. All right. The final uh, low flow administration method before we go on break is the non-rebreather mask. Now, this type of mask has a reservoir bag that is attached to the mask, which inhalation draws from to fill the mask through a one-way valve. And then it features pots at each side of the for ex ex exhalation so that as you are breathing in the oxygen you're also able to breathe out carbon dioxide now this results in an ability to provide a person with 100 percent oxygen at a very high rate of liters per, uh, liters per minute which we call lpm flow rate now a reservoir bag is an attachment to an oxygen uh, administration device it allows for the concentration of oxygen and thus increased percentage of oxygen administration now, when we allow the collection of 100% oxygen in the reservoir bag, the person may then receive a higher concentration of oxygen by reducing the percentage of inhaled gas that is made up of atmospheric oxygen. Again, you're going to see the image of a non-breather mask. And when we go on break, we'll come back and look at other modes of oxygen administration. 
We have looked at the low flow administration methods, and we have looked at four of them. When we come back, we'll be looking at the high flow oxygen administration methods, and then we'll look at the other methods of administration. This has been Expose with Tony Akiemi, brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. Don't forget what we need is no more medication, but more education. For the best prescription is knowledge. To be informed is to be transformed, and to be uninformed is to be deformed. Don't go away. We'll be back very shortly. Introducing MK. Healthy Newsletters on various health topics by Reverend Tony Akiemi. Order, call, plus 234-90-732-92100. When I came and I listened to Reverend Tony, everything about my mindset changed immediately. I've attended uh, many seminars on wellness. I've taken many courses to on wellness, but I have been well impacted here. Sincerely, I don't have a single regret for coming. Welcome back. This is Expose with Tony Akinyemi, brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. I want to thank you once again for spending your evening with me. In case you are yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, please look at the subscribe button right at the base of your screen as you're looking at this event and just click on the subscribe button. There's also a little notification bell, you know, jingle bell. Just click on that bell so that whenever we come live, your device, either your phone or your iPad or your laptop or your desktop, wherever you're watching us from, that device will notify you that we are live. Okay, so subscribe on YouTube and also click on the notification bell. Then on Facebook, those of you who are looking at us, watching us on Facebook, just uh, like us on Facebook uh, and that would be a good idea. Now, we're looking at uh, supplemental oxygen, oxygen therapy. We're looking at therapeutic gases or medical gases, gases that can be used to treat or to improve health. And we have looked at hydrogen gas, now we are looking at oxygen gas. Now, most of us are familiar with oxygen because probably at one time or the other, either we ourselves or somebody we know has been placed on oxygen before, so that's not strange. The one that may be strange to some people is hydrogen, and then the third one, ozone. So we'll be looking at the three of them. We have done with, de dealt with hydrogen. We are dealing with oxygen at this time. And so what we are looking at is, so far today, we have looked at uh, combination therapy using hydrogen plus oxygen to get better effects. That's the first part we started with today. And the second thing we have looked at is the indications. In other words, what and what and what kind of medical conditions can benefit from supplemental oxygen therapy. We have looked at chronic conditions, we have looked at acute conditions that may benefit from oxygen therapy. Now, the third thing we are looking at today is the different modes of administration. How is oxygen administered to people? 
and we are looking at different modes. The first mode we have looked at is the low flow administration method. And we have looked at four different types of low flow ag administration method. The, the cannula, the uh, um, face mask, and different types of face masks and what have you. Now we are going to be looking at the second mode of administration, which is high flow administration. Now high flow administration comes in different forms, okay? We have high flow nasal cannula, uh, otherwise known as HFNC, which is a nasal cannula. The cannula is the one that has two points that enters into the nostrils. Uh, so high flow nasal cannula is actually a nasal cannula with the capability of also humidifying oxygen. And it is capable of flow rates that are far higher than the other ones, the low flow administration. So it's able to uh, give flow rates that exceed the inspiratory pressure of the individual that is receiving the oxygen therapy. Now, this setup of high flow nasal cannula allows the delivery of 100% flow while maintaining the person's ability to utilize the mouth to talk, to eat, to drink, and what have you. So the high flow nasal cannula, HFN, uh, HFNC, you know, may also be used to lengthen times of apnea in preparation for intubation, you know, for those who need intubation. Now the third mode of administration of uh, oxygen, supplemental oxygen, is what we call positive pressure administration. Positive pressure administration. Now, uh, and that, that speaks of, uh, there, there are four different approaches to that. The first approach is what is known as CPAP. Now, CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. Now, it is a kind of mask that delivers continuous positive pressure oxygen pressure, you know, to the patient. The second one is, uh, is known as BiPAP, bi-level positive airway pressure. Uh, it's also positive pressure delivered via mask, but it has an inhale and an exhale pressure set, you know, at different levels. Then the third type of positive pressure administration is called BVM, BVM, that's bag mask device. Now, these are masks that are operated by hand, you know, for resuscitation when the person, you know, can no longer breathe on their own and, and they can, you know, they, they, can, they cannot connect to oxygen sources by themselves. So they are hooked up and then the oxygen is delivered under pressure so that that can increase the amount of oxygen delivery into that individual. Bag mask devices. Okay, and the fourth one, most of us have heard about that. Uh, no thanks to COVID-19. <laughs> when COVID struck the world, all of us started hearing about ventilators, ventilators, okay? That's an example of a positive pressure oxygen administration, okay? These are machines that, you know, they breathe for the patient, so to speak. Ventilators are machines that breathe for the patient because, you know, sometimes the patient is so helpless, they can't breathe by themselves for themselves. So you need something to help them breathe. So ventilators are machines that breathe for a patient either through a tracheostomy or endotracheal tube. You know, the ventilator can have oxygen delivery titrated to specific patient needs, you know, and delivered through positive pressure. Now, endotracheal tubes possess the added advantage of occluding the, um, the airway, you know, thus preventing aspiration of blood and secretions and such other complications that may arise in the patients that are on the ventilator who are unable to protect their own airways by themselves because they are more or less helpless at that stage. It's a very, very uh, serious emergency situation where ventilators are used as an example of oxygen administration. It's one of the instances of positive pressure administration. So in administering oxygen, we've looked at low flow administration, we've looked at uh, high flow administration, and we've looked at positive pressure administration of oxygen. And uh, the image of a ventilator will also be shown to you. Now, so these are different ways by which oxygen is delivered. The fourth one will include other methods of uh, oxygen administration, which can be a combination of, uh, of the different 
ways in which oxygen is administered. Uh, but I will be zeroing in specifically to um, maybe two of them. One is called EWOT, E-W-O-T. That is Exercise with Oxygen Therapy. Now, this is a way of utilizing oxygen while exercising, either by using a cannula to deliver the oxygen or a mask to administer the oxygen. Typically, people will be on the treadmill, where they're working on a treadmill, and then the oxygen, they are wearing the cannula or the oxygen mask, they are breathing in the oxygen while they're exercising. Or they sit on a stationary bicycle and they are riding, exercising while breathing in the oxygen, or any such similar you know, equipment. That's called EWOT, EWOT, Exercise with Oxygen Therapy. Again, we are going to show you images of people that are breathing in oxygen while exercising. All right, then uh, the other one that is very, very important, which I really want to highlight, is the HBOT. HBOT, that is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And, and I don't want to rush this one because I really want to spend time to discuss hyperbaric oxygen therapy because it is not very popular, particularly in my part of the world. I have discussed this with quite a number of people in Nigeria and many of them have not heard about it or some of them who have heard about it, they think, oh, it's only used for, you know, sports medicine. When, when people suffer injury, uh, professional athletes, uh, sportsmen and women, when they suffer injuries, they normally use hyperbaric oxygen therapy you know, in rehabilitating them. But I have found that hyperbaric oxygen therapy is one that is particularly very wonderful, and it is one that we should be exploring. I, I am expecting, hopefully soon, that hyperbaric oxygen chambers will be installed in almost all our major hospitals, and even in private hospitals in this country. Uh, already in the Western world, they have this... Uh, things already installed and they are being utilized for so many wonderful things, particularly for brain problems, brain injury and uh, neurological problems and various other problems. We'll be dedicating a whole episode to look at the medical application, the benefits of using the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. We look at how it works. We look at the benefits that are derivable and the kind of conditions that can really benefit from using the hyperbaric oxygen uh, chamber. Now, there are different types of oxygen uh, HBOT chambers. Uh, there are small ones that individuals can buy uh, for domestic use at home for those who can afford to. Uh, I've been trying to talk to some guys here in Nigeria to see if they can help me source for one that can be installed in Nigeria, you know, that can be available for people to use. I've also spoken to a number of medical doctors in Nigeria who have private clinics, so ask them if they have such a thing or if they are willing to install such a thing. I believe that it's going to go a long way to bless those who really need such services. And by the time we're able to get some of these things installed in our hospitals in this country, many of the conditions that have defied other modes of therapies will benefit immensely. Wounds that will not heal very quickly can be helped, you know, to really heal people who suffer, you know, brain damages through trauma or through stroke or through different kinds of, uh, you know, cerebrovascular accidents can actually benefit immensely uh, from oxygen therapy using this one. Now, hyperbaric oxygen chamber is where uh, and it, they, they put oxygen into the chamber under higher pressure than atmospheric pressure. So the individual can either lie down in that chamber normally and just be breathing normally. There's nothing spectacular about it. The only difference is that there is a lot of oxygen in the chamber and there's a lot of pressure. The atmospheric, the pressure in the chamber is higher than atmospheric pressure. So it helps to force the oxygen to go in by fire by force, you know. That is why it is called hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Now, there are those you lie down inside and I believe one will be shown on the screen for you. And then there are those you can actually sit down. You can sit down inside the chamber 
and you can even be working on your laptop. You can, you can be reading a book. You can, there are those that can sit multiple people, maybe two people or four people. So you and your partner can actually sit down there. Maybe somebody who is the patient who needs it and maybe a family member that accompanies the person. You can all sit down there and enjoy oxygen under high pressure than atmospheric pressure. That is hyperbaric oxygen therapy or HBOT for short. I promise you I'm going to dedicate a whole episode to EWOT and HBOT and looking at the different ways. And these are non-invasive, painless, and very easy to administer kind of therapies that should be available to all and sundry and it's going to benefit us in many, many, many wonderful ways. All right, I am also going to be interviewing some medical doctors uh, in Nigeria. Would you believe that? In Nigeria, medical doctors. They are Nigerians and they are practicing their trade in Nigeria. I'll be interviewing some of them, one or two of them, on hydrogen therapy as well as oxygen therapy and ozone therapy. These are people who are uh, widely traveled, who have been trained in Nigeria as well as abroad, who have a wide experience in these therapies. They will be able to share their experiences with us and tell us how particularly those of us in Nigeria can access some of these services. And those of you who are out there in the Western world, of course, these things are relatively more available here and there. All you need to do is a quick search to find out from your, I mean, in your, in your neighborhood to know whether there is one close to you or the other and, and have a chat with the practitioners to get to know how you may benefit, whether it can benefit your condition or not and how you can access such services. So this is how far we can go today on therapeutic gases, focusing on oxygen therapy. In the next episode, we'll be looking intently, more in-depth at hyperbaric oxygen therapy and exercise with oxygen therapy. And then from there, we'll move on to ozone therapy, after which we will now interview practitioners who can speak much more. You know, I am just, I call myself a health enthusiast. I'm not a medical doctor. I am a computer engineer and I'm also a nutritionist, and I'm also a theologian. So those are the three areas I am certified. I have certificates in those three areas, uh, as a computer engineer, as a theologian, and as a nutritional consultant. That's all. I am not a medical doctor, but there are medical doctors that can tell us much more in this regard when the time comes. Once again, thank you for spending your beautiful Monday evening with us today. Uh, in the month of August 2022. Uh, I believe that by the time we are done with this series on therapeutic gases or medical gases, you would have garnered sufficient information to see how best you can take advantage of the opportunities that exist in this domain. Thank you. Don't forget, once again, what we need is not more medication, but more education for the best prescription is knowledge. And so before I go here again is my hydrogen water bottle and the hydrogen is bubbling through it. And once it does that for about three minutes, I drink the water and then I replenish the water, and bubble my hydrogen through it again. And that's a beautiful way to live life. Next time I'll show you, hopefully, some other devices, the nebulizer, the uh, pulse oximeter, and any other one available. Maybe my little ozone generator that I have at home, I can also show you that. And the different ways to administer it through insufflation, through uh, different ways. I mean, you get to know as time goes on. Thank you once again. Have a beautiful evening and have a pleasant week ahead of you. Bye-bye and God bless. Introducing healthy newsletters on various health topics by Reverend Tony Akiyemi.
To order, call plus 234-90-732-92100.